the origins and development of the Indo-European language family. Uh, in older textbooks, it was generally known as the Aryan languages, which was a perfectly good term from Sanskrit. Arya, uh, uh, er, era mean, means uh, noble. So an implication is that Indo-European languages almost certainly came with the second migration. So the technology for ancient DNA has been around for several decades, but really in 2010 it became possible for the first time to obtain really meaningful ancient DNA data. Prior to 2015, that was dominant was that it was the spread of agriculture and the movements of people that this new economic system would have allowed from the Near East that probably spread these languages into Europe. Um, and we now know that's wrong. There's a mass movement of people who are uh, from steppe pastoralist backgrounds, and they formed north of the Black and Caspian Sea about 5,000 years ago, and they spread uh, through Europe. So the people who spread this ancestry and originate this ancestry are an amazing group archaeologically. It's a group called the Yamnaya. So the Yamnaya are the first people who use a new economy in the open steppe lands. Um, the wheel had shortly before been invented and the horse had shortly been domesticated and they hitched horses to wagons, wheeled wagons, and used them to bring supplies and water out into the open steppe. These people spread over a vast territory all the way from Mongolia in the east to Hungary in the west. Um, and the genetics shows that they also spread into Europe and are the single primary most important contributor to Europeans today. It's a 90% population replacement. When we look at the environmental data, uh, it's, it's huge. Uh, they burn off forests uh, totally over vast regions and create step-like environments. Uh, we have a complete genetic dominance of, of male lines from the step from the third millennium onwards. Neolithic male uh, genetic lines go completely extinct, more or less extinct. These were male warriors coming in in, in large groups. Uh, the women had been ad abducted, they were Neolithic, they were non-local. That means males coming in had preferential access to local females again and again and again and over the generations. So it's telling you something about culture. It's what I didn't tell you is stories of rape, torture, subjugation, humiliations over several centuries inflicted upon children, women and men. It's about narratives lies the question of power, visibility in how Britain, just like most European nations, is trying to deal or not deal with a past that is source of trauma for part of its citizens. The Stuart Hall language plays a role in representation. Representation shapes memory through often painful process because memory, let's not kid ourselves, memory is about power. So it's also about what has been forgotten, erased or simply was unknown at the time. It's about community stories being part of a national narrative. It is about history and memories. So cultural memory brings to life the role of co the conscious and conscious cultural practices. Asman argued that it is not about accuracy when it comes to the stories of the past. It is not about disputing the subjectivity of individuals about that event. It's about what people chose to remember, how they chose to remember, and how they transmit those memories to their communities. So Indo-European languages tend to be spoken, associated with more of this ancestral North Indian, West Eurasian related ancestry. Um, and within any region, people who are of traditionally higher social status in the traditional caste system have significantly more, on average, with important exceptions, uh, ancestry related to West Eurasians. So this is clearly telling you that the collision of these populations with these different ancestry types, what we call ancestral North Indian and ancestral South Indian, was a cultural phenom phenomenon where, again, uh, there, there are differences uh, of culture that are left in the caste system today, for example, in languages that were associated with this mixing process. Of course, keep in mind, in the 19th century, the big obsession was race. Uh, there was something called race science, which was nicely invented. And the studies of Vedic societies were fitted into these racial categories that were worked out for the 19th century. Now, to talk about an Aryan race is, if I may say so, absolute baloney, to use a polite expression. It is a conflation of a linguistic category with a biological category. 
you do not refer to biological categories by languages and you do not refer to languages by biological categories. Therefore, people have stopped using the term Aryan race. When I say people, I mean people. <laughs> okay. Well, I hope I don't ruffle any feathers. My speech might be a little radical for some of the old guard. <laughs> it would take quite a bit to shock any of this crowd. Uh, ancient DNA um, is um, teaching us that much of what we thought about the past is wrong. Many people asked me to write a book on this topic and wanted to come to terms with it because it is very disruptive, it is very challenging, it is very interesting. Read that back to me. I'm afraid that might make me sound pompous to your readers. Uh, my brilliant research in brain transplantation is unsurpassed and will probably make my name live beyond eternity. No, that's all right. Take out the probably. It just makes me sound wishy-washy.